Charles Graves, author, has tried to capture the essence of Linda's life in a recent book about her, in which he details records of cures said to have been effected through her agency. It's a strange story, which he was not prepared to write at first. However, he was given proof which impressed him. Seven years after the child died, all the people whom she helped are still going strong. Now, if this book had been written a year after a death or six months after a death, there'd be no proof that the kid had done them good. As it is, there are people all over the island who can say, look, so I am well. Entirely thanks to Linda. Charles Graves. And the little girl who died in 1961, aged five years and two months, was a child who spent almost the first three years of her life in hospital as a badly handicapped infant. She was born with spina bifida. Her spine was exposed and she had hydrocephalus, which was partially relieved later by two operations. But never in her short life was she able to walk and she couldn't read. Yet she developed a vocabulary more suited to a well-educated undergraduate and this is the mystery of Linda Martell. She cured some 2,000 people. How? In a scientific age, one approaches this story with caution. Linda was in one sense a lucky girl, for when she eventually left the sheltered care of a hospital nursery to live at last with her parents and her four older brothers in a small, rather shabby bungalow called Calgary on the Palmgrove estate at St. Sampson's Guernsey, she might well have been swamped with an overdose of protective love and affection, which could have obliterated her amazingly mature, independent spirit. But Linda's parents, Eileen and Roy Martell, had little time to fuss over her. Money was scarce, and Eileen had to go to work. So instead of letting Linda languish at home and arranging for baby minders, Eileen took Linda to work with her each day. Did Linda like playing with dolls as she sat propped up at the end of the packing shed? Talk to people, anybody, about anything sort of thing. But to play with toys, no. Her main delight was flowers. But when she came home from the hospital, she was two and three quarters. She didn't speak much, but by the time she was three, she did have a very good vocabulary. How do you think she picked this up? I've no idea. Did you have the radio on a lot? No. I was to work most of the day. She'd hear you and other women talking there? Yes. Oh, yes. No. But I mean, in a packing shed where you don't get um, the sort of speech, that, uh, <laughs> she came out with <laughs> An advanced vocabulary acquired in some unknown way the first mystery of Linda's life. And within the next few weeks, she began displaying a tray that even now, after thought, discussion and research, baffles the reasoning mind. For Linda began to cure people. It must have been embarrassing at times for her mother, for, as she told me... Even to take her for a walk, she said, stop. So-and-so over there is sick. That lady over there has got so-and-so. Well... You just had to stop, and that was all there was to it. So Eileen had to go up to complete strangers and ask them to come over to her little girl on the other side of the road because she thought she could help improve these strangers' health. It seems an extraordinary thing to have done, yet Eileen did it not so much as to indulge her little girl, but because events in the bungalow had already indicated that Linda was no ordinary child. Her father, Roy Martell, told me about those events. I got home this particular day. And Arlene had the meal ready, you know. And, um, oh, I said, no, no, I'm sorry, I don't want anything, I've got to go to bed. I said, these headaches, I don't know if i got a tumour on the brain or, or what. So, um, this little th sitting in her chair there, she said, a headache, Roy? She said, come and see me. She said, I'll help you. And she just said, you'll be all better now. In two minutes, I was in bed, you know. Five minutes later, I was back, Arlene. Yeah. She touched your head? Just, yep, yeah, smack on, right there, you know, where it was just about giving me the works, you know. Did you, at that moment, think, ah, oh, now she's cured me? No, I don't really know what I said. Well, oh, I didn't even put it down to that, you know. I didn't put it down to that. And then one day I went home and then Peter was in, you were at work with um, Linda, eh, Arlene? And when I came home, um, Peter was in bed, you know, and Barry said to me, oh, 
He's sick. He's been sick. And, oh, I thought, oh, here we go. So I went in, and, and that, he was flushed, you know, and, oh, dear, oh, dear. I thought this. Anyway, when Arlene came from work, she said, where's Peter? So, um, oh, I said, he's sick. He's in bed. So uh, Linda said, sick. She said, bring him to me. And to please her, I said, call him out, you see. And she said, come and see me, Peter. So when I were needed, she just put her hand on that there. She said, you'll be all better now. Well, I'm sure it wasn't more than five minutes, eh? Might have been a quarter of an hour. I didn't time it out. He came all dressed fine, fine, right as rain. Fluke or chance coincidence? Or was it surely the answer that the family was slightly in awe of this crippled child? Indeed, as throughout the ages, cripples have been regarded as possessors of an extra power. The evil eye, the devilish authority of the hunchback, literature is scattered with allusions to the supernatural gifts of the badly handicapped. So then, one answer could be that Roy Martell and his son Peter, both wishing in their hearts that Linda was normal, attributed to her an extra power to make up for her crippled body. Another theory, Guernsey people have for centuries lived close to nature, and supernatural experiences are part of their tradition and folklore. Perhaps because of this, they might be especially responsive to suggestions. I met and talked with the Reverend Francis Drake, a man who has lived in Guernsey for many years, in charge of the Monet Chapel, a tiny chapel of healing. I think we must be careful about this. Um, it has been said that the Guernsey people are particularly suge suggestible. It's much truer to say that they have kept a certain open purity of mind and that um, they haven't been blinded to realities. The reality of looking after Linda included the normal routine of washing, changing, feeding. And because she was so physically handicapped, she hated being fussed and cuddled. But her grave interest in people, relations, friends, strangers, began to attract to the bungalow a growing stream of visitors. At first, not many. But slowly, the rumor grew that there was an odd little girl up on the St. Sampson's estate who was said to be able to cure ailments. Eileen and Roy grew used to opening the door to such visitors. I remember on one occasion, four or five people came, uh, came down and they had a little boy. And they'd been sent down by a publican, by a Mr. Francis. And the knock at the door, and so I opened the door to them. And they said they'd been sent down by Mr. Francis, so I took them into the lounge, you see. I went and fetched Linda. Now, I didn't know these people, they were on holiday, you see. And um, I brought Linda in and sat her on the carpet, you know, and I said to her, now, who have you got to see to, my love? Oh, she said, it's a little boy. She said, he suffers in his head. She turned to the woman and she said, uh, this is little Anthony, isn't it? Well, the woman looked at me and I looked at her. And um, she said, I said, is his name Anthony? She said, yes. Oh, yes. But she said, who told her? Oh, I said, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Is there any sort of explanation, Mr. Martell, for this? Could she have not perhaps overheard a conversation where the child's name, Anthony, was mentioned? No, because I'd never seen these people before. Never seen them before. And I can t I've never seen them again. So, Linda knew people's names without being told. And as if that wasn't puzzle enough... Linda could tell who was dead on a photograph. Or who was sick on a photograph and where. Well, that statement of Roy's has been checked. And extraordinary though it seems, Linda on occasions was able to detect sick or dead persons from among a group photograph of strangers. This power, it will be fashionable to call it ESP, extrasensory perception, seems to be the only explanation of an incident told to me by Mrs. Flo Bates, a cousin of Roy's. It became a rather enjoyable family custom for the Martells to visit Flo Bates for a gossip and tea on a Sunday afternoon. Sometimes Mrs. Hilda King, Mrs. Bates' next-door neighbour, dropped in, but on this particular Sunday she hadn't done so. During the afternoon, Mrs. Bates noticed Linda sitting quietly in a corner, playing. She was sitting down on the rug, playing with a string of beads. Suddenly she said, I must go and see Auntie Hilda, she needs me. So I asked why. So I said, she's quite all right. I saw her a short time ago in the garden. So she said... Oh, no, I must see to her leg. Well, I didn't know anything about a bad leg or anything like that, but Eileen took her in to see Mrs. Keene, and um, she brought her back about 
ten minutes later. And I said, was anything wrong with Hilda? So she said, yes, there was. She'd stood on a small table to do something, to reach a shelf or something. The table slipped and Hilda fell and she'd hurt her leg and she was very badly bruised. Well, how did that child know? Well, how? Mr. Drake believes that... Here we have a little girl with miraculous powers that nobody can explain. What are we to, what are we to say? All that I can say is that she had in herself at the age of three various gifts and qualities that most people haven't got at the age of 60. It's no good denying the truth of them because hundreds and hundreds of people knew it was true, experienced the truth of it, and came to her because there was no denying her powers. Mr. Drake, a man, it seemed to me, who would question events meticulously before pronouncing on them. Of course, it's difficult to focus with precision on Linda now, for she died in 1961, and years have a habit of clouding facts. Mrs. Bates agreed with me that the passage of time blurs impact, but even so, recalling her niece now, she said, She was very extraordinary, you know. You had to know her. <clears throat> you had to meet her to know her. the extraordinary power she had. One person who did know Linda quite well is Mrs. Margot Le Poidevin, who lives just across the street from Flo Bates, her neighbour. Oh, Mrs. Bates told me, she, she asked me if I'd ever met Linda, and I'd said no. So she said, when the next time she comes up, she said, I'll come across and fetch you. It was one Sunday afternoon, and I asked my husband to come over as well, because he wasn't at all well. Linda wanted to sit on his lap, and uh, she seemed to love him, didn't she? She said to him, oh, you're not very well. He said, no, I'm not very well. But when we got home, he said, she seemed to have done something for me. He said, I, I feel different. I certainly feel much better once she's been sitting on my lap. And Mrs. Le Poitavin herself was later eased of an acute back pain which had been causing her great distress. Linda put her finger on the place, and to this day, Mrs. Le Poitavin has kept well and fit with no more back pains. Indeed, one of the many puzzling things about Linda's doctoring is that she somehow was able to diagnose almost exactly what it was that people were suffering from without being told. Charles Graves has reported in his book, case after case defying rational explanation. A crying baby, a stranger, was cured of what might have been an abdominal blockage simply because Linda in some way knew it was there. The assistant matron of a hospital, ill for months from spinal arthritis and more or less unable to move at all freely, walked at length and comfortably after Linda had touched a certain spot on her spine and on her knees. There are countless similar case histories, but medicine and the practice of it is a science, and science demands proof but it's hard to find proof for many of Linda's cures. The Guernsey Medical Officer of Health is Dr. Trevor Thomas. He only met Linda once, but has talked since her death with many people who were once cured by her. I believe that she, with her abnormal brain, she must have picked up subconsciously a lot of information in hospital when she was being nursed. I think there might also be an element of extrasensory perception here. She sensed that the people were worried about some part of their body. Certainly a possibility. And at this stage in the story of the mystery of Linda Martell, it's a relief to have an unemotional explanation. But to so concentrate on illness and health must surely mean that Linda was preoccupied with sickness. After all, her own long hospitalization must have had some effect on her for most young children of three are utterly unaware of illness in other people. Was Linda obsessed with illness, Eileen Martell? No, I don't think so. Did you discuss illness a lot in the house? No, definitely. No, nobody was ever here ill at home, apart from the normal headache and that sort of thing, but nobody was ever ill. 
But one year, Linda's aunt, Flo Bates, was ill, very ill indeed of bronchial asthma. Linda cured her, but Mrs. Bates, though quite willing to believe in Linda's powers, doubted really whether the child had had any lasting effect. Then, as time went on... Well, I think when it got to November and I was still well, I began to think that um, possibly there was something in it after all. Now, you were a mental nurse, in fact. You trained in a mental yes. hospital. And you, of all people, know how important the power of suggestion can be. Oh, yes. Very much so. Do you not think that in this case, the suggestion that Linda was about to do you good, this, in fact, did the good? Uh, no, I don't think so, because I didn't really believe it. Not at the time. I was sort of um, cured... Oh, I don't know, without my knowledge sort of business. Now, medically, bronchial asthma is notoriously uh, a complaint that's associated with highly strung people, people with nerves. Yes. Couldn't you perhaps have levelled out, as it were? Well, that the previous winter before Linda came, I'd been so ill that I used to think in terms of if I was alive this time next year. Because when you're fighting for hours and you can't breathe, believe me, it gets very wearying. And life loses what little savour it has. But Linda, you feel altered all this. Oh, she did. She really did. Again, the voice of reason from Dr Thomas. I believe a lot of people did, in fact, obtain relief through the agency of Linda Martell. I also think, though, that most of the things, if not all of them, were psychosomatic in nature. And by believing that they were going to be cured, they were cured? I think so. An ill person is worried, and a, a worried person can be made ill by worrying. And she helped alleviate this worry? Oh, she did. I'm quite sure. She helped people to cure themselves. Calm sense and objectivity from Dr. Thomas. But sense doesn't entirely satisfy the curiosity about this little girl, who was only three or four years old, remember, a baby with thoroughly unexpected gifts. Eileen and Roy coped as best they could with the ever-increasing number of visitors to their bungalow, and Linda's four brothers stayed out of the way and went to their club to practice boxing. It must have been a strain having Linda for a sister, a girl the object of attention, a girl who did strange things. I met Peter, the brother nearest in age to Linda, and asked him how he remembered the time when Linda was living at home. My age being only seven when she was found to be a healer, it was obviously um, stunning to find it like that, you know. But um, we all used to get on very well with her. I mean, we never used to run away when she called us, if you like to put it like that. I myself got eased of a few pains, you know. It was nice to have her around, but I mean, well, to be quite frank with you, I don't, I don't like to talk about it. I don't talk about it much. A reticence natural enough. Talking to people about Linda, I suddenly heard of another aspect of her personality. Though so young, she was, mysteriously, able to meet older people on a common level. Mr Drake noticed this in her. Almost the only explanation of a person like Linda is that somewhere she has lived before, not necessarily on the earth. When I looked into her eyes, I looked into her, the eyes of an elderly woman. We appreciated and acknowledged one another as mature adult people. It was an extraordinary experience. I, I think it, uh, that it should be said that this power to heal, this extraordinary grace, is usually found in people who have at some time suffered profoundly. Uh, Linda was only three years old. I, I knew her and met her. When she had suffered, I wouldn't be prepared to say. But I don't think that these extraordinary powers, this deep knowledge of people, the psychic powers, are just accidental. 
they arise from some form of evolution. When Linda evolved, I don't know, but she was a, a very old soul. I asked Mrs. Bates whether she had also noticed Linda's curious gift of harmony with older people. Well, yes, that's just the point, because she was such a baby, really, and yet she was older, because when she spoke to you, she was sort of seemed as though, um, whatever your age, she was parallel with you in all the things. She could talk to you so sensibly, and it was really marvellous. She could understand problems of a woman of your age? Oh, yes, yes, she seemed to. And yet, how could this be possible? How could a baby know what a woman of 40 or 50 could be going through? Well, I don't know, really. There are no answers to questions like that, at least no easy answers. But perhaps Linda herself gave an answer when she spoke to her father one day and told him something revealing about herself. I remember on one occasion Linda said, I died before, you know. I died before. Well, she was about three. Well, you don't get children of three, you know, talking about dying before or dying for the next time, do you? No, not usually. But a child who has had a traumatic experience might muddle actuality and dream. The vivid experience of being put to sleep for her two operations might have seemed to Linda in retrospect to be a sort of death. Charles Graves is less impressed by such psychological explanations. I think it's safe to say that she's existed several times before on this earth. And I hope now, after all her suffering, she's in orbit. The mystery of Linda's life is heightened still further by another series of events which began to take place in the bungalow. Roy Martell told me about them. It was the visitations that she had, you know. I mean, these were night after night, during the day. I mean, many times she said to my wife, Arlene, my Jesus Christ is standing by you, you know. The curious thing about this knowledge of Jesus Christ and Linda's conviction that he visited her is that the Martell family have never made much of religion at all and are and have never been particularly interested in church going. However, a visitation could be just a little girl's fancy. But then, Eileen herself saw something. That was in the early hours of the morning. And she was talking. Her cot was in your room? Ah, yes. Mm. Yes, at that time. This particular night, it was later than usual. I think it must have been two or three o'clock in the morning. And I happened to glance across to the cot, and there was a glow on the floor at the side of the cot. And um, a few minutes after that, the light went, and she cried. What it was, who it was, I don't know. Well, of course, one immediately thinks of all the rational things that it might have been, a car well, headlamp. Well, a car headlamp, definitely. I thought of that. But there was nothing shining through the window. A reflection from the moon? No, I, no, I don't think so. And on that particular estate, there were no street lamps. So there was nothing of that. Well, then, what was it? Mrs. Martell, what do you think that light was? Well, as far as I'm concerned, she, as she was talking, it was the Lady of Lords she was talking to. But above all, how did Linda Martell know exactly in what part of their body a person was suffering? The publican of the Cambridge Arms, Gordon Huff, went to see Linda after consulting without success for many years various doctors. He was almost unable to walk because of a back complaint. He's a man who would, without hesitation, brush off a supernatural happening as easily as he would dust cigarette ash off the bar counter. Yet, when he went to see Linda... She put her finger right on the spot where it was aching. And it just seemed to disappear slowly off like that. From that day onwards, I felt no pain whatsoever. How could she know the right spot? Uh, it's uncanny. I couldn't tell you that. Don't know. That was Nancy Wise, reporting from Guernsey. The book, The Legend of Linda Martell, by Charles Graves, is published by the Icon Press at 35 shillings.